We are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Kathy Breen. Kathy Breen works at a Catholic Worker House of Hospitality in New York City, and she is also with Voices for Creative Nonviolence. As part of the Iraq peace team, she lived in Iraq before and during the U.S. shock and awe campaign in 2003. She returned to Iraq about eight months later for another three months. She has spent time in both Jordan and Syria with Iraqi refugees as witness to their reality and to advocate for their resettlement. And in November of last year, she went back to Iraq to see how Iraqis are faring, what they are saying, and to see Iraqis who had fled to Syria but have had to return. So start out, tell us, how is it that you came to go to Iraq in the first place? I was invited to be part of the Iraq Peace Team by Kathy Kelly, one of the co-founders of that movement. Um, and I remember after 9-11 how purposefully the images of the hitting of the two towers, the Twin Towers in New York, were shown over and over, day after day, to justify, I believe, our bombing Afghanistan. And I was actually in Union Square in New York City at a demonstration when we got the news that we were bombing Afghanistan, that we had begun. And something in me, just like a primal scream, cried out silently, we need to be there. So I think in being invited to be part of the Iraq peace team, I was able to respond to that call. We need to be along ordinary Iraqi citizens in the event of an invasion. And unfortunately, that invasion happened. And you actually went to Iraq then in late 2002? Was I think it? it was late September, October 2002. And then I was able to, with others, to stay on in the months preceding, the five months preceding shock and awe. And then actually during shock and awe, some of us were in Baghdad. And we were even able to visit the bombing sites and hospital sites. And I'm a nurse by profession, and at first I didn't, I resisted that. But then I forced myself to do that, and it's something I'll never regret. In fact, I just found recently in a binder some of the letters I wrote home to during that time. And I have one before me from March 23rd, which is today, 2003, so 10 years ago. And if I may, I'd like to read a little portion of that. I just, well, it starts out, dear friends, I'm so anxious to get some word off to you while there st is still time. Even as I write you, there is a bomb exploding, threatening to blow out the windows. While I'm not getting less fearful of the bombs, I think I'm getting more used to them. Or maybe it's overall lack of sleep that has me moving more slowly. I just returned from visiting the Yarmouk Hospital where a few of us were able to go to see some of the wounded. A sad sight as I moved from one bed to another and saw some of the victims of this senseless massacre. The hospital received 108 patients in a three-hour period on Friday evening. Last night, another 40. Dr. Rajab related the case of a 26-year-old mother who came in with massive injuries Saturday night and was taken immediately to surgery. Her two-year-old child, however, was killed instantly as the rocket went directly through the door of their home. And on I go. Today in the hospital, family members and the wounded asked me, why is this happening to us? Why, why? In the five months that I have been here, I have only met with people who want peace and who pray for peace. They do not want war. They have done nothing wrong. And I imagine that was fairly consistent people just wondering why is the U.S. attacking? Yes, and I would be stopped in the street. This is before the invasion, but it was getting, it seemed to be clearer and clearer that there was going to be a war against them. And I remember one woman stopping me in the street and saying, is Bush going to bomb us? Because I was from the United States. They felt somehow I had a line to the White House. And, and she lost a son in the first Gulf War. And she said, take our oil, but don't bomb us. Were you aware of U.S. media coverage of uh, you and Kathy Kelly being portrayed as, you know, human shields at that point in time? 
you know, um, we tried to keep abreast of the law because, I mean, the excuse me, the, the media news, and we would huddle around a, a radio uh, shortwave on trying to pick up Colin Powell's address, trying to follow step by step so that we could also respond to that. You know, we were calling people in the United States, we were calling on them to do anything necessary, any kind of civil disobedience, anything disobedience, anything necessary in order to stop this madness. And at that point in time, did the Iraqi people make the separation of the difference between what the government was doing versus what the citizens of the U.S. were doing? They did. They did. I And I. it's always, and to this day, it's very humbling how warmly and graciously uh, we're received as people coming from the United States. I think that shifted when Bush was elected the second time, that we sent a message to the world that we can no longer say, or we can no longer expect people around the world to say, we understand that it's the U.S. government and not the American people that are doing these war crimes, because we actually let him take the presidency a second time, and he's seen as a war criminal the world over. But you know, Mike, I would like if it if you don't mind, I having gone for six weeks uh, in the w- fall winter of last year, I would like people to hear what Iraqis are saying, and not so much what I'm saying, how they find their situation ten years into the war. For instance, I would like to to just let a young twenty twenty three year old woman who graduated from university in English in Baghdad uh, speak. She was about 13 when the U.S. war on Iraq broke out, and I asked her how she feels the war has affected her country. And she told me that she feels people have changed, that they think of themselves, and it is not good, she said. Things have gotten worse. Children 8 and 10 years old think of weapons and killing. They do not have the thoughts of children. She said, I would be afraid for my own children growing up in this atmosphere. I have never felt safe since the war. We've forgotten the real meaning of safety. I hope it doesn't get worse because it is my country. I hope for all the good for it. She wants to be a teacher, and she says the mass exodus of the professional class has had a big effect on her generation. I'm afraid, she said, the level of education is very low, even in the colleges. The good teachers have left the country, but she wants to teach the new generation in the right way, not as her teachers taught her. She said, I want to do good to positively affect society. I have hope for the future, and I wish the goodness in people becomes greater than the evil. Iraqi people are very kind. But after the war, many changes happened in the psyche. And she says uh, that the government should fix the electrical system, the water system, the roads, and make jobs for those who graduate. Graduate. There is corruption inside every ministry, she said. Change has to come from inside the government. One of the things I found there is, is this feeling of helplessness and hopelessness among Iraqis um, because of the rampant corruption in all the ministries and also because of the lack of security that which continues i might say that be, because we don't get this news that in 2012 4471 civilians were killed in iraq and in the month of january this year 177 deaths and in february 136 deaths and just recently on the 19th of march there were almost 100 deaths throughout the country on the anniversary of the invasion, U.S.-led invasion. So I think we need to be clear and this, that the war is not over. And <clears throat> another young man who is in his third year of English told me this. The war is not over, he said to me. It continues until now. The damage of the war is like Hiroshima. Remember the Halabja, the survivors? Our babies are deformed. We have many in Karbala, he said. Many have left their homes to go to another country. Kidnappings are still happening. Kidnappings of small children, and not only for money, but to make us feel scared. Everyone has hopes for the future, but we can't. 
We are scared about the insecurity of the situation. What will happen? We have to go back to our roots, to our holy roots. We are entering 10 years and what has changed? The terrorists have come from outside. And, and this is something that I think we have yet to grasp in this country. That, and I was told on more than one occasion in this trip, you opened terrorism to, you brought terrorism here to this country. I'd like to also speak, let a sheikh that I met, a gentle, mild-mannered man. I had a conversation with him in a trip to Basra. We were many hours in a car. And I asked him what he felt the effects of violence has been on Iraqis. And he responded through a translator that the Iraqi people were living peacefully, different groups, together side by side, until the Iraq-Iran war. And then the wealthy and poor alike were sent to the front to fight. And this was the outbreak of violence. He said, we consider the American people, represented by the soldiers who fight a, the war against us, as war criminals. We saw how they were cruel and savage, how tanks ran over innocent people. It became normal for every household to lose loved ones. We saw terrorists whom we caught and handed over to the U.S. troops later released. Many wrongdoings are credited to Islam, but the U.S. was wrong to bring terror to Iraq. The Iraqi people are religious, and they will become strong and resilient again, he said. So on this trip, I was able to see Karbala, to spend time in Najaf, to go many times to Baghdad, to make a quick trip to Basra, and also to go to Fallujah and Ramadi. And um, I would really like to let them come to voice, especially, and we know in Fallujah, we had the U.S. Uh, carried out two major assaults. I believe it was in April and November of 2004, and really decimated that country. And I had an opportunity to sit in on a lecture in English of fifth year university students. And the president of the college asked me if I would say a few words afterwards as an honored guest, which was quite awkward and embarrassing for me. And the professor actually sped up his PowerPoint presentation so I would have some time. So here I am standing in front of this lecture hall and introducing myself somewhat to give them some context and saying that I hadn't been back for, for nine years and I see that there's no water, potable water, and no elect national electrical grid. The electricity kept going down. The air pollution is so bad that I had to close the window at night in order to sleep. But anyway, I said, I'd, I'd actually like to hear from you if I may. And, and I just stopped talking. And then there was complete silence. Nobody spoke. And then a, a young man said from the front of the auditorium, he said, we have nothing to say. The last years have been only sad ones. And again, there was silence. After a while, an impassioned young woman from the middle of the lecture hall spoke up, and it was obviously not easy for her. What she said took me days to recover from. She said, it's not about water and electricity. You have destroyed everything. You have destroyed our country. You have destroyed our ancient civilization. You have destroyed what is inside of us. You have taken our smiles from us. You have taken our dreams. Someone else then said, Iraqis cannot forget what Americans have done here. They destroyed the childhood. You don't destroy everything and then say, we're sorry. You don't commit war crimes and then say, sorry. To bomb us and then send teams to do investigations on the effects of the bomb? No, it will not be forgotten. It is not written on our hearts. It is carved in our hearts. We are happy to make bridges between people, but we will not forget. What can you do? In Fallujah, 30% of the babies are born deformed. What can you do? Another person spoke of meeting an American soldier in the airport who had been part of the special forces in Iraq. 
The soldier told him, the Bible tells us not to kill, but we were taught to kill, to kill for nothing, just kill. I'm so sorry. And the young person said, build bridges, apologize. And there was absolutely no rancor in his tone, just anger and deep pain. I could say this too. Um, outwardly, things appear better. And, and Iraqis will tell you this. Outwardly, things appear better. But they are at a low point. They have been working for such a long time, and they see no improvement. Uh, you see new cars on the road, for example. Salaries are better. Uh, but they, the corruption is so rife. Iraq is like the first in the, in the world, I think, in terms of bribes. And they said there was no hope under Saddam, and there is no hope now. The difference is we can talk in front of everyone. We can even speak and criticize the government. But, but nothing changes, and we feel helpless and powerless to, to change. Um, yeah, so that was, that helplessness and hopelessness um, I found very distressing. And Talk a bit more about there are still millions of refugees, Iraqi refugees, who have not come back to Iraq, some that have come back that you um, had met were promised the equivalent of, I think, 1000 or $3,000 if they returned, but that never materialized. Well, I, we just are beginning to get a sense of what is happening in the country with, term, with respect to ministries and, and how they're functioning. And I we were able to meet with someone from the Ministry of um, Immigration and uh, Displacement. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't even have the title correct, but uh, he was able to give me concrete information on how much uh, the government is allocating for returned refugees from Syria, let's say, who are having to come back to Iraq. Um, and this, how it's supposed to work. Uh, so one of the families we knew that had come back had not yet received this money, and we were trying to to uh, question that. It I find it very awkward to tell you the truth as a U.S. citizen to go to to question anything in the Iraqi government because we have been so intrusive and so arrogant and so it's it's a it's a very hard thing to do. I find to 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 question them now, to interrogate them, so to speak, on how they're doing things correctly or incorrectly because of our history in that country. I do want to say this. I had the opportunity through that visit to get a tour by car of the Green Zone. And I had not been in the Green Zone until maybe eight or ten, nine months into the occupation when the US, em when the US Embassy was in one of Saddam Hussein's former palaces. That has been given over to Maliki. And now the U.S. has built um, an embassy there. And I have to say, every U.S. citizen should see that embassy. It's, there's almost an obscenity to it, I find. It's, as far as the eye can see, uh, it's so big. And there are 16,000 people employed in that embassy, and I believe another 8,000 to, to protect them. Uh, and every time I use that figure, I have to Google it because I can't believe it. And Iraqis ask me, what are they doing here? What are they doing? What are 16,000 people doing in Baghdad in the U.S. Embassy? And that's a very good question I would like to know myself. Um, it's the largest embassy in the world, it isn't is it? It is the largest embassy in the world, to my knowledge. And those 8,000, aren't they mercenaries? They, yes, I would call them mercenaries. So... At the same time that the country doesn't have electricity most of the time, uh, and you could touch on that further about it, what, yeah. how much people have to pay just for intermittent That's electric. Right. Yeah, I, as a nurse, I was able to visit hospitals, but, but just I was very interested in basic services, obviously. And what, during my stay, of course, the electricity kept going down and... Uh, and the water, there's no potable water. There's no national functioning 
electrical grid, and there's no potable water. You have to buy the water or filter the water. And even in visiting the hospitals and seeing the children, the sick children, uh, half of them maybe in some of the wards that I was were there with gastrointestinal uh, problems and others with respiratory problems, not to mention the increase in cancer and that there's still no functioning radiation center in Baghdad or in the country. There, there's one center that has 60-year-old cobalt radiation machines, and people who need radiation have to be sent to Turkey for radiation. Uh, they're still in some form under sanctions with respect to radiation. Uh, and I think it's called Chapter 7 or Chapter 8. I, somebody could, You could easily find that by Googling it. Um, so the electrical system, yes, I, I took photos of the all the wires, the network of wires that lead to these neighborhood generators. Uh, when the national grid goes down, then that is supposed to kick in. And you just a ballpark figure, a family might pay $10 a month to, for the national grid and another 50 or 60 to the person who's running the, the neighborhood generator, of which there's one every couple of blocks. And uh, it's just, oh, and the other thing in Baghdad, if I had to, three words to describe Baghdad, they would be check, checkpoints and cement barricades and traffic jams because of the checkpoints. And you have to see it to believe it. Of course, I had heard many stories, but, but to see the Baghdad, just all the cement barricades cordoning off universities, neighborhoods, it's, it's very, <laughs> I don't know, I don't have the word to describe it. Uh, and being stuck in, in roadblocks and traffic, traffic jams, I had heard these stories, but then to, to have that experience myself was, yeah. So though the war has been presented as over from our administration and the corporate media, it's far from over for the people that live there. That's right. And even assuming that the U.S. was interested in helping to actually rebuild or, God forbid, some form of reparations, even if that started tomorrow, with the amount of destruction we're looking at probably couldn't be even solved in our lifetime. Would that be fair? I think you're correct in saying that. A, a young high school teacher in a village school, he teaches English, said to me, the situation is very bad in Iraq. The politicians are corrupt in the whole country. They are looking for their own interest. The regime didn't serve the people. Now the government doesn't either. I see no hope for Iraq. The boys don't want to learn. They've been affected by the war, turned into beasts. They've seen blood and killing. They are violent with no principles, no respect. And yet, then you have another someone who says, a 23-year-old, um, he says to me, I like Shakespeare because he gives the world advice to be or not to be. He writes poetry all the time, and his father complains, and he tells his father, I must write poetry. I cannot stop. When I write, I fly. You know, there's this interminglingness, juxtaposition of this feeling of helplessness and hopelessness, and yet this, this tremendous inner resilience and ability to get up and go on, which gives me hope. You know, those yeah, the young people that I met who want to rebuild their country, who are looking for ways to, to bring change. And even though they feel helpless and say, we see no hope, they, they have a determination that's admirable and that gives me hope. You've been doing multiple talks here in the greater Seattle area, and one of the things you focused on was a, a young a young man now, I guess, but he was six years old when he, due to electrical uh, Yes, problems. there's a young man. It was the last image, actually, that I was left with. It was the night before I was leaving uh, the next morning to return to the States, and a doctor, a woman doctor, an orthopedic doctor, brought this young boy, Mohammed, who is now 14, and his father to see me. And when Mohammed was six years old, he was coming home from school, and he stepped on an electrical wire, which had been downed by a U.S. bomb. And he lost both his legs and both his arms. 
And when I saw him, uh, he had two leg prostheses on, and he was able, when those prostheses were put on him, to stand and walk. And I, I just said to him, Mohammed, you're, you're one of the bravest boys I've ever seen. But there was something so broken in him to think that since he was six years old, he because his arms are severed way, right up at the, at the uh, shoulders. He's never been able to touch himself, itch his nose, pull up his pants, eat, be, embrace someone. Uh, and what they wanted was to see if we could help him get one arm, a simple prosthesis. Um, so I have that image with me, and uh, we've been trying to, we hear that Shriners has a new house policy that they don't take foreign children now. Uh, we've been trying to see if in Jordan we could help him get the family get to Jordan to get an arm. But, but these are the consequences of war that, that we don't see. You know, this child's mother went blind at the time of that accident. She's still blind. It, there's a certain name for that, that type of blindness that's caused when a shock is so great. You just can't see it. Uh, so I, even in my presentation, I show his picture as difficult as it is to, to look at because this is what war is. And this is the kind of war, we, the consequences of war we're not allowed to see, very rarely. And is there a concrete way that people can contribute towards getting him? Uh, well, you know, arm? I certainly will want to stay in touch, Mike, because if I can come up, if we could find a way to get this child, maybe in the Middle East, some attention, then there might be a concrete proposal we could put forth for some money to, to help in that endeavor. And again, this is just one example of Yes, this is just millions. one example. That's right. My driver, who such a dear man, his own child, his oldest boy was kidnapped when he was six, and he's suffering tremendous psychological effects. There is no Iraqi family without a story. I can tell you that. There is no Iraqi family without a story. And so many of those families are trying to escape. Yes, and many Iraqis now would leave if they could. They would leave the country, tragically, if they had uh, another option for the sake of the children. All right, we are just about out of time, but... Um... You know, I, there's one thing I would like to close with, if I might, and I've used it over the years, sometimes in speaking or in writing. It's uh, from C.S. Lewis, and it comes from the preface of The Great Divorce. I do not think that all who choose wrong paths perish, but their rescue consists in being put back on the right road. A sum can be put right, but only by going back till you can find the error and working it afresh from that point. Never by simply going on. Evil can be undone, but it cannot develop into good. Time does not heal it. With that, we are uh, pretty much out of time. Can people, I believe people can follow your writings and your work via the... They can go also to Voices for Creative Nonviolence, and that website is www vcnv.org, Voices for Creative Nonviolence, www.vcnv.org. All right. Well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. I want to thank you very much for coming and spending time with us. You're very welcome, Mike.